Moscow, the seat of government of the Soviet Union. It's a city that will be very much in the news, and for once it won't be gloomy stories of great power rivalry or the arms race. Moscow is to host the 1980 Olympic Games. The citizens are preparing for an invasion of overseas tourists, and the visitors will be an inquisitive lot. Not only will they see the world's finest athletes in competition, they will also be able to get a first-hand glimpse of life in modern Moscow, and so judge for themselves that other competition between communism and capitalism. And behind the superficial similarities, life is quite different in this workers' paradise. For one thing, just about everyone works, often in factories like these. The average wage is only $44 a week, though with extra productivity it can go as high as $68. Yet productivity in Russia is only half what it is in America, probably because no overtime is allowed here. And what are the expectations of the Russian people? Lydia Noskova is 27. She's worked here for 10 years making X-ray machines. She intends to stay in the same job until she retires at 55. A staggering 51% of the workforce are women. That's more than anywhere else in the world. Even the security guard on the gate at this factory is a woman. Nurseries and kindergartens are attached to nearly every housing estate, so mothers can leave their children from the ages of three months upwards. And older children aren't left to run around the streets when school finishes. Their leisure time is carefully organized in a variety of clubs. Moscow alone has 300, into which the state pours millions of dollars a year. This one is a showpiece, lavishly equipped with almost every conceivable interest catered for, from ballet classes to car driving lessons. And across the lobby, the grandmothers patiently wait to take the children home. Home for virtually every single one of Moscow's eight million inhabitants is a high-rise flat. Women and children not being at home during the day eliminates many of the social tensions associated with such housing in other parts of the world. And it's considered the quickest way to reduce the long queues of people waiting to be rehoused. Interestingly, you can jump that queue by buying a flat. A quarter of all homes are privately owned here. It can cost as little as $10 a week to run a flat. That includes heating and hot water from a network of power stations covering every district of Moscow and piped directly to each home. With basic living costs so low, the Soviet system runs into a major problem, an almost constant shortage of workers. Job advertisements on every street corner meet with little response because many people earn enough to take several months unofficial holiday every year. So not enough consumer goods such as cars are produced to satisfy demand. And a very ordinary saloon, if you can get one, will cost about $22,000. So with car prices almost out of reach, the average commuter prefers to travel on the Moscow Metro, which is reputed to be one of the most efficient underground services in the world. The underground is also designed to protect as many as possible of Moscow's eight million citizens from a nuclear attack. That's probably the reason for the extraordinary size of the platforms. These wrought iron decorations conceal hinges for gates which swing across and seal the system off from the world above. Each station has its own computerized monitoring board linked to a central control. It helps to ensure that trains run every 40 seconds during rush hour, every eight minutes at night. On every platform, a digital clock tells commuters how long has passed since the last train left. 5,000 people work in the Moscow Metro, but the train drivers are the elite, earning wages that are twice the national average. How much do the drivers earn here? How much do заработок машиниста порядка 250 до 300 рублей. Up to 300 rubles a month. That's about 230 pounds. 
Can you tell me whether you have any strikes here? А если у нас здесь забастовки? Забастовки нет. У нас у нас все удовлетворены и условиями труда и. Everybody is satisfied. And satisfied too, at least with their travel arrangements, are the 6.2 million commuters who use the metro every single day. So great is their pride in it that if anyone dares drop the tiniest bit of paper, someone is certain to pick it up and give it back to them. But they do have some things in common with travellers on undergrounds everywhere. Few read, nobody speaks, and most try very hard to look at nothing in particular. A casual glance in shop windows gives the false impression that consumer goods are readily available. In fact, they're scarce. There are lengthy shortages. In the food shops, a surplus of tinned fish and vegetables conceals scarcities of fresh vegetables and prime meat. The distribution and marketing of goods across a country covering 11 time zones often sinks under the weight of bureaucratic inefficiency. A queue built up rapidly at this fruit store when the word spread that a few crates of mandarin oranges had arrived. The price, a reasonable 86 cents, is unimportant here Availability is the problem. There are constant shortages and bottlenecks. A crowd appeared out of nowhere to grasp a sudden delivery of gramophone records to this street trader. Because there's not a lot to buy, there's little incentive to work harder and earn more. Even taxi drivers hand all their fares over to the state in return for a fixed wage. Out in the suburbs, new style supermarkets better organized, better stocked, are starting to appear. But even here, old suspicions and habits die hard. Bread is often still tested for freshness. What it all adds up to is that there's a lot of money floating around with nowhere to go. Some is diverted to a state lottery. $1.50 a ticket with a chance to win $8,000. Imports of foreign goods are frowned upon because of the effect it would have on the balance of payments. So the only other place to put your money, apart from the mattress, is the state savings bank. The interest rate is only 2%. Although religion runs counter to the state ideology, clerics claim young people are starting to return to the fold. But if you want to see young couples getting married, don't waste your time waiting around outside churches, for most couples get married at the registry office. But you'll probably have better luck at Red Square on a Saturday. Here you'll find dozens of typical Moscow saloons distinguished by an unusual display of gaiety. For marriage, Moscow style is usually followed by a quick trip to Lenin's tomb. Every Saturday, hundreds of newlyweds hurry past the policeman and up the cobbled slope to pay their respects to the leader of the Bolshevik Revolution. But the fact is that Lenin has not been smiling on Moscow's marriages. Almost half of the city's adults are divorced. One third of all those married in 1977 filed for divorce in 1978. The fact that virtually all women have jobs here is offered as one explanation. But sociologists are also looking at a probable conflict between the Soviet constitution, which actively supports complete equality of the partners in family life, and a lingering male chauvinism, which, after the first few heady months of marriage, refuses to acknowledge this. And during the week, too, you'll find long queues for Lenin's mausoleum. Sometimes the crowds stretch all the way round the Kremlin. People from all walks of Moscow life will wait for two hours and more to pay their respects to the leader of their revolution. It's an expression of loyalty, of course. It's also the inevitable product of a society where virtually the only advertising to be found is of a political kind. Posters proclaim the Soviet revolution as the main event of the 20th century. Inside every factory, pictures of the members of the ruling Politburo occupy pride of place on the walls. Motorists on the city's ring road are reminded that there is great democracy in their local councils and that the Soviet way is the way to peace. 
Wherever you go, the country's history and ideals are paraded in a way that surfaces only at election time in Western countries. The two main daily newspapers, Pravda and Izvestia, are pasted under special hoardings on every street for people to read free. While they often criticize certain aspects of the system, their interpretation of home and world news essentially reflects the government line. But the political stranglehold on advertising shows signs of weakening. For sale and wanted columns are proving increasingly popular. Among the products in great demand, second-hand furniture, childminders and country cottages. November the 7th was a very important day this year to the world display of military and industrial might. In spite of chill winds gusting at 20 degrees below zero and snow flurries that turned faces blue, the people turned out in force to celebrate the 62-year-old revolution. They'll do a lot here to keep the red flag flying. It's a time when the leaders, like Kosygin and Brezhnev, are honored. For Western observers, it's a pointer as to the health of the Russian leaders, both well into their 70s. Who will succeed Brezhnev is a game played publicly by reporters from the West. Names to watch are Chernyenko, aged 67 and very close to Brezhnev, Kirilyenko, aged 73, who often deputizes for his leader, Viktor Grishin, a sprightly 65 and a strong trade unionist, and Yuri Andropov, head of the KGB. Despite the powerful visual impact of the military muscle on display here, experienced Western observers said there was nothing new and much that was at least 10 years old. However, this was only the third public outing in two years for the latest Soviet medium-range tank, the T-72. High-level policies such as detente are decided here in the Kremlin, the seat of government. Next door is the Supreme Soviet. And beside that, the Spassky clock tower, Russia's answer to England's Big Ben. What was the armory at the time of the revolution has been converted into administrative offices and a museum. Just outside the Kremlin walls, St. Basil's Cathedral. Visitors are reminded that Ivan the Terrible had its architects blinded so they couldn't design anything even more artistically outrageous. It's been converted now into a museum. And so have the cluster of cathedrals inside the Kremlin walls. The Soviet leaders don't seem to object to these constant reminders of the religion they rejected dominating the view from their office windows. Not surprisingly, the Kremlin is the top tourist attraction for visitors to Moscow. They come to see the biggest bell in the world and the 11-ton chunk of it that broke off when well-meaning firemen poured cold water on it after a fire. And to be photographed beside the giant cannon built by one of the Tsars to frighten the enemy. The psychology of the arms race was every bit as important 400 years ago as it is now. Squatting strangely among all this history is the Palace of Congresses, where the Communist Party delegates meet, considered by many to be the one architectural blemish in a political working environment that is among the most stunning in the world. And this Russian monument too, in its own way, symbolizes the race for space. In this case, the race for airspace, through which the Soviet government reaches for the hearts and minds of people the world over. 
Radio programs are compiled by special teams and beamed to most countries, both in their own language and in English. Some of the programmes are uncannily similar to Britain's famous BBC World Service. While the BBC starts its programmes with the chimes of Big Ben, here they use the bongs of the Spassky Tower. The Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko today completes his official visit to Spain. Beamed through powerful transmitters on wave bands very close to those of the BBC, Radio Moscow often blots out the London signal. 63-year-old Zina Levashova is one of the announcers who introduce news, features and pop music for 19 hours a day. It's a far cry from the stilted Russian broadcasts of old. Do they see their job as providing propaganda? Ah, uh, that word propaganda. I used to know a man who said that um, to his five-year-old baby who doesn't want to go to sleep a lullaby, is propaganda. Depends what you mean by the word. If you mean a way of putting across our ideas, telling our side of the story, what life is like here, what we believe in, uh, then the answer would be obviously yes. It is not an effort to fool anyone or to mislead. It is an effort to let people know what we think through our own means, rather than reading what other people say we're supposed to think, or hearing what other people say. Moscow's World Service is also transmitted on the medium wave band to the Russians themselves in the hope that it will prove attractive to the growing number of people who, as the Kremlin sees it, are being corrupted by bourgeois broadcasts from the West. This is the new high-rise village that will be home for the world's top athletes during the Olympic Games next summer. Eighteen identical tower blocks spread over 100 acres in southwest Moscow. The slush of early winter, churned into mud by men and machines, gives the impression that much remains to be done. But the main structural work is finished, and the teams of Soviet workmen are confident they can complete the fitting out before the really hard weather sets in in January, leaving some minor landscaping and decorating for the spring. In one of several concessions to the expertise of the capitalist world, kitchen equipment from West Germany makes its way to a restaurant that will seat 4,000 and serve 360 international dishes. But the living quarters are Russian through and through, with extra robust furniture that will be given to factory workers and students once the games are over. These rooms make up a typical apartment for a team with six athletes. As well as offices, they include a coach's room, complete with TV and blackboard, Two small kitchens, where pride of place is given to electric samovars for that quick brew-up Russian style, and three bedrooms. No time to be choosy here. Everyone sleeps two to a room. And 15% of all the beds are a mighty seven foot six inches long for those athletes who are walking tall even before they get onto the track. This entertainments complex, with its concert hall and disco, is unique. For tucked away in its depths will be special halls like this, where Christians, Muslims, Buddhists and Jews can worship. For one brief month, religion gets the communist seal of approval. And if you should be surprised to find four kindergartens and two schools on the site, it's not that the competitors are getting younger, just that when the Olympics are over, the whole village will become a new, if rather luxurious, suburb of Moscow. Three and a half thousand people will be rehoused here. They put up a fence around the entire site. Not that the Russians will admit to any security problem, but no one except essential workers will be allowed in here for three months before the start of the Olympics. And during the games, there'll be no armed patrols inside the village either. That's a source of continuing alarm to the Israelis, even though they'll occupy the top floor of one of the blocks with another floor of Russian security men below them. But the Russians say with formidable confidence that no illegal weapons will enter the country, let alone the village. One problem they do acknowledge is that of accommodation. The 3,000 beds in this new French-built hotel are a drop in the ocean when 300,000 foreigners are on their way. There'll be hotel rooms for only a third of them, and that allows for a fair amount of doubling up. So, Moscow's 80,000 students have had their exams brought forward two months to release their dormitories for guests and free them to work as waiters, interpreters and taxi drivers. 
This is a special school where would-be waiters are already learning to look after foreign visitors during the Olympics. In fact, most of the extra help required will be drawn from Moscow's student population, who are being taught just how capitalists like their meals presented. The training will ensure that even though some of the food labels may look unfamiliar, the style of service will not. Menus will be printed in several languages, but just in case you need an interpreter, ten and a half thousand of them are taking crash courses in no less than 45 tongues, although English, French and German are expected to be the main languages of the games. It occupies an exceptional place in Russian architecture and deserves to be considered at length. This boulder's departure from classic or Byzantine architecture... Elsewhere, you'll find more students brushing up on local architecture or simply making sure they know every inch of Moscow's streets and even taking lectures in French. Ils seront logés dans le village olympique et dans des hôtels de première classe, Rossiya, Cosmos et d'autres. Perhaps the luckiest of all are the trainee barmen, here learning the secrets of such Western delights as a white lady or whiskey sour. Up to now, their knowledge of alcohol has been limited to drinks produced inside the communist bloc. Their lecturer confessed that it was not without significance that all the bottles in use here were empty. Foreign drink manufacturers laden with samples are making regular visits here to check that their products are being treated with appropriate respect. Outside, as a subject of further study, there's a glass case containing samples of all the crockery, cutlery and glassware to be brought in for use during the games. Behind the scenes, in almost every hotel and restaurant kitchen, hundreds of trainee chefs are being put through their paces, and there are clear indications that the Olympics will see a dramatic improvement in the limited and repetitive menus on offer in many Moscow hotels today. There's even a special library of famous international cookbooks, so it could be that the Olympics turns into something of a gourmet's paradise. And there's certainly no skimping when it comes to the great Olympic sports complex itself. A chain of stadiums and arenas has been virtually ready and waiting for months now. This, the Lenin Stadium, the biggest, has already proved its worth with last summer's Spartakiad and regular football matches ever since. After the last match of the season, the groundsmen put up the fencing. The rubberized running track was in use right up to the first big snow. The swimming pools, of course, are in use all year round, even when the temperature drops to 40 below zero. A tough lot, these Russians, although they're trying hard to convince us otherwise with the help of Mishka, the cuddly cartoon bear adopted as official mascot for the games, which beams out from hoardings and shop windows all over the city. For those who won't be coming here to meet Mishka themselves, there's a special communication center with no less than 92 studios, 22 of them for foreign television companies, and all able to send out their own individual coverage of the games through this switching center from where signals will be beamed throughout the world. Or at any rate, that's the idea. They've got 200 miles of cable here that they haven't quite finished joining up yet. And visitors won't lack for local color in the evenings. In hotel restaurants like this one, Muscovites mingle with tourists from other parts of the Soviet Union. On the menu, Russian-made champagne and Georgian wine that flows as sweetly as the old Russian folk song playing gently in the background. But the last few years have seen the Soviet Union succumb to a massive musical invasion. Western pop music and dancing styles have taken off in a big way here. Boney M and ABBA top the list of bestsellers, and the fever is gripping young and old alike. The Russians see the games as a giant public relations exercise for their capital and their country, aimed particularly at the Third World. So even the splendid rooftops in and around the Kremlin are gleaming after a $145 million facelift.
those anticipating a visit to Moscow will see one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And all the indications are that their visit will be well-planned, trouble-free, with every need catered for.